So good morning, everyone who's coming in from the Americas. Good afternoon for anyone who's joining us from Europe and good evening for all of you coming in from Nepal. And welcome to today's webinars uh, on meeting the producers of various uh, natural ingredients from Nepal. Uh, my name is Yolanda. I uh, work at uh, Profound, which is a consultancy based in the Netherlands. And together with uh, Traffic, Ansop and Farewell, who are also uh, with us today, um, as well as various other partners, uh, we are finalizing a project in Nepal called Succeeding with CITES uh, Sustainable and Equitable Jasamansi Trade from Nepal. And in today's webinar, we'll give you an overview of uh, the project, and what it has been achieved, why uh, Jasamansi from Nepal, uh, and what we've been doing to uh, make this trade more sustainable. We'll introduce you to five different uh, producers, um, as well as uh, Fair Wild. So our um, agenda for today is as follows. We'll start uh, with Anastasia Timoshina from Traffic, who will be presenting an overview of our project um, that's been funded by uh, Dharma Initiative in the UK. It has been running since 2018, and we're about to finalize it at the end of March. Uh, about uh, Jatamansi from Nepal, how to make it more sustainable and equitable, uh, what we've achieved so far, um, why this project is necessary, and what we look forward to in the future. And then I'll share with you a short video of uh, where five companies from Nepal introduced themselves and their company uh, to, to all of you. Um, and then we'll wind up with an introduction to Fair Wild, which is a standard that has played an important role in this project. And we feel is an important aspect to make uh, equi trade, just monthly trade, more sustainable. And this will be uh, presented by Emily King uh, from the Fair Wild Foundation. And after this, we have time for short uh, Q&A. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please write them down in the chat uh, box so that we can answer them during Q&A. Um, and then we'll have a short wrap up where we'll also share some contact information with all of you, uh, which I also put in the chat uh, for today so that if you have any further questions uh, that we didn't get to in Q&A or any uh, interest in talking to the producers themselves, uh, you know where to find them. So I'll start with giving the floor to uh, Nastia from Traffic who will be uh, sharing with us an overview of the project uh, of Nepal and why we chose just Mansi uh, and what we have achieved so far. So take it away, Nastia. Overall, um, it's estimated that in Nepal, more than 300,000 households are collecting commercially um, medicinal and aromatic plants. One of the really, really special plants, the one is that is the subject of, of our webinar today, is called Nardastachius grandiflora or Jetamansi, um, or spikenard or nard or Jetamansi, many different names uh, that it's known for. Um, it is one of the most important species, very high in value, um, and also it provides a very large number of people uh, with income. Um, so the, this estimates, you see on the slides here, that there are about 15,000 people in Nepal that um, um, receive about 25% of their annual income from Jetamansi harvesting. So it sounds like, um, you know, an important underpinning of local economy, an important underpinning of local livelihoods. However, um, next place, sorry. <laughs> That was a cue. <laughs> However, um, when when so three, three years ago, um, when or five years ago, probably um, when we've been talking to um, to our partners in Nepal and um, in other places around the world, um, something that came and 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 is very striking or uh, for this species is that um, there are very low rates of value addition. So. Um, and lack of direct access to international markets for the producers, which all generates kind of conditions in which some of the trade is illegal, uh, some of the trade is illicit, meaning that there is no proof necessarily of, of sustainability, traceability um, of trade. Uh, Jetamansi has been listed on the Appendix 2 of CITES, which means that um, 
it's a regulated trade, so trade in in this species needs to be accompanied by uh, permits. Um, and it's also been classified as critically endangered on IUCN red list. There is also where where was our starting point was a very complex policy issue um, in Nepal. So three four years ago, um, with CITES Act that essentially did not allow ban the trade in Chetamansi from Nepal. But also taking us back to that landscape, um, you know, we, we're thinking about the ecosystems that are very sensitive to climate change, land use changes, and over harvesting. So, all in all, um, it's 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 a situation in which trying to understand how we can bring in um, incentives and opportunities for sustainable harvesting was so so important. So, next please. Um, three years ago, we um, we received a grant from the UK government's Darwin Initiative and engaged um, in particular with the Asian Network for Sustainable Agriculture and Bioresources. A few colleagues are here on the on the uh, call who are leading implementing partner in Nepal, um, as well as uh, Nep Nepal government, um, Fairwell Foundation, Profound, IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, University of Copenhagen, a fantastic partnership with, with a, an extreme amount of knowledge and expertise in different aspects of trade, regulations, policies, um, certification. The, the main premise of the project is to try and increase and demonstrate that, that we could have a sustainable management in this very special species, a species that is very sensitive to harvesting, um, that it can that, that the value addition is possible, and also that we can support the implementation of CITES rules. Next, please. Um, we focused on, we obviously um, in the scope, scope of any project is limited to, to um, certain areas. So uh, for this project, we focused on eight community forest user groups in Northwestern Nepal. You see them on the map. Um, and next, please. And our activities, um, you could you could roughly think about five different areas in which we worked. So we've set ourselves to develop a set of tools and capacities for for producers, for producer enterprises. Um, we've set a, a very challenging task of engaging with the um, Nepal's legislation uh, that regulates trade in Chetamansi and other CITES appendix to listed species. There was a whole suite of activities we planned around sustainability. Um, as well as using certification, so voluntary mechanism, market mechanisms of certification as a roadmap and finding opportunities for scaling up. And part of this scaling up opportunities I feel is happening right now in this conversation. But one, one more thing I should add before I carry on and talk about the outcomes of the project is that um, our starting point in this project was this combination of a very strong skills and expertise from non-governmental organizations, the government agencies, um, market development agencies. But also there were a few partners that are not listed. Their logos aren't necessarily listed, but we had an engagement, very strong engagement and interest from industry, from private sector in Europe, in the US, which, um, you know, which, which expressed the interest in Chetamansi being certified against fair wild best practice in order to demonstrate the full sustainability and traceability of this production um, as a third party verified process. So this is where we started our project. Let's see what we have achieved so far. Next, please. So first things first, a uh, fairly challenging um, issue of um, collaboration, collaborating with um, the government of Nepal to amend the CITES Act and formulate CITES regulation. Um, so what has um, happened since 2017 and 18 is that now there is a, a, a revised CITES Act which allows the trade in, in Jetamansi and other CITES appendix to listed species and has an underpinning regulations underneath it. Um, UNSAP has provided technical input to, pre to prepare non-detriment findings. What it means sounds like a very technical terms, but what it means is that it enables the establishment of an expert quota for, um, for this species. And in even more simple language, it means that the legal trade in Jatamansi from Nepal is possible uh, within the scope of the quotas. We've been also engaging um, quite a bit on the international with on the international kind of regulations of trade in Jatamansi. So with the CITES 
secretariat and also importing countries. And it is very much in the context of um, exploring how how the application of voluntary certification such as Fairwild can actually help um, help producers that are exporting, say, to Europe or you ask, how can it help them to demonstrate that um, their production is in line with, with good practices and what is the evidence underpinning it? So we're now working on developing a case study on the application of Fairwild in Nepal and Jatamansi for the next CITES meeting. Next, please. This sustainability as a big heading has been obviously a very big focus of this project. Um, we've developed extensive training materials on a whole range of issues. Sustainable harvesting is mentioned on this slide, but it also involved uh, negotiations, uh, price setting, um, uh, establishment of a fair wild premium fund, um, traceability. Um, the approach that was taking is, is a train, training of trainers. So we've trained a number of people uh, who became resource people in those communities. And overall, over 2,000 harvesters in those eight community forest user groups were trained in sustainable techniques and fair wild standard requirements. Next, please. There was a lot of work done on the ground. You know, we need a clear underpinning and explanation of what is actually happening with the resource on the ground. So there has been a resource inventory undertaken in eight community forest user groups covering over 10,000 hectares. Um, we, we, that allowed to establish the sustainable annual allowable harvest volumes for Jetamansi and few other species. We've also helped develop or re-input into the operational plans of the community forest user groups. Um, and this is very, very important because that takes us through to the long-term sustainability and the monitoring. Once these principles become part of operational plans, the community forest user groups are bound by them in order to implement them into the future as well. Next, please. We've worked um, around in terms of the value addition um, beyond training around sustainable harvesting and, and, and other approaches. Uh, we looked into the upgrade of distillation facilities um, in those community forest user groups and training people to um, in their safe operation and management. Um, again, to enable the extraction of essential oil from, from, um, from rhizomes. And we've been, uh, farewell certification has been a really big focus of the project. And it has been a best practice that anchored the activities that anchored the implementation of work and created a really, really useful framework in order for activities to fit in. Next, please. And finally, clearly, you know, for, for, from our perspective, and I'm talking about this as, a, as, a, as somebody working in the conservation sector, um, the you know, because this sector, this this project is so focused on trade, um, ability to demonstrate the actual commercial links and um, the trade and sustainable and traceable uh, jetamansi and other resources is an important part of it. So there has been quite a bit of effort um, put into making the connection to the buyers and re-establishing um, the, the commitments. And this webinar is part of this. Um, next, please. This takes me really neatly into what can you do? Um, for the project and for this um, uh, for this work. Um, well, one of the reasons we're having this event is because um, we'd like to encourage buyers that are looking for um, Jetamansi and other potential uh, resources um, to purchase sustainable, traceable and legal um, ingredients from the project sites. Um, we have lots of ideas about how the project can develop, how we can increase it into further areas, into other species, uh, with a general focus on those high altitude areas of Himalayas that are so, so um, important. Um, so please do stay in touch, we'll provide our contacts. And also we do quite a bit of work and try to think really hard about um, some of the obstacles to, you know, sustain uptake of the sustainable practices in wild harvesting and how can we encourage more engagement for the consumers um, you know how, how can consumers and and brands understand that um, you know wild harvested species are part of their portfolio um, and what can they what can they do about this so a few different ideas in there um, there is a fair wild week which is a social media communication campaign in which we're promoting the uptake of um, good practices and on this, uh, I'll can stop. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think the next slide has my contact detail and postpass, um, and uh, we'll drop them in the chat as well. 
I, I've just I've just done that actually already, Nastia. So anyone who wants to uh, contact Nastia or or push back from Ansap, uh, contact information are in the chat. So thank you for that update. Uh, the next part of today's webinar is uh, introducing you uh, to five of the companies that we've been working with in Nepal. Um, I've listed them here. So it's Himalayan Biotrade, Bahobali Herbal Essences and Extracts, Annapurna Aroma, Satya Herbals and Namuna Herbals. Um, I am starting a new share so that uh, I can share a video that we've made for all five of these companies. Uh, and I'll also make sure that we uh, include their contact information in the chat uh, in case you want to reach out. Namaste, I'm Khilendra Guru. I work as a technical and expert manager at Himalayan Biotrade Company. We are based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Himalayan Biotrade collaborates with the community producer groups and concerned stakeholders all over Nepal for the sustainable sourcing of products. We are involved in the production, quality management and marketing of products in domestic and international markets. Our major products are essential oils, both from oil harvested, including Chattamasi oil, and also from the organic farm. We also deal with vegetable oils, hops, and handicraft products. Almost 80% of our products are oil harvested. Our major destination markets are United States, EU, Canada, UK, Japan, and China with a yearly turnover of approximately $1 million. We are a socially responsible company who care for the environment and create employment opportunities to the poorest communities living in the remote Himalayan regions of Nepal. Our products are of the highest quality and purity, which are sourced sustainably and ethically with the mission to promote these products globally. We would be happy to provide the samples and additional details of our products and look forward for the long-term collaboration with you all. Thank you very much. Hello friends, Namaste everyone. I am Sanjay Kumar Jain, CEO and MD of Bahubali Herbal Essence and Extracts Private Limited, Nepal means Nepal. We produce natural essential oils from Nepalese herbs, which found in Himalayan range of Nepal. Our factory was established in 1996. Our major product is Jadamasi oil, that is known as spike nard oil, in a volume point quantity. And except Jadamasi oil, we produce some other essential oils like Valeriana, Xanthoxylum, Calamus, Chamomile, Mentha, Zulipar, etc. We have organic certified and interested in fair wide certification. Our main market is India, China, and EU. Namaste, I am Prasun Satyal, Managing Director of Annapurna Aroma Company Private Limited. We are producer, exporter, processor of organic certified essential oil. Our main products are Dutamasi Wintergreen, Wintergreen, Himalayan Solar Forest, Juniper Berry, Leaf, Valeriana, etc. Our annual turnover is around 1 million euro and we do 99% of export, uh, export of our products to Europe and US. Uh, we are socially, economically and ecologically responsible for improving local livelihood. Our products are 100% pure and organic certified with EU standard and USD standard. Uh, for more detail, you can visit our website organic-eo.com and aromaoils.com.np uh, and you all are always welcome to visit our 
uh, cultivation area, collection area, as well as distillation facility. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste and welcome to Nepal. My name is Ravindana Sukla. I am CEO of Satya Herbal and Spice Products Private Limited, which is located in Western Nepal, nearby Nepal Gan City. Our vision uh, to foster global well-being and empowering rural people of Nepal. We are producer of essential oils, botanical extracts, spices, and raw medicinal herbs. Our major products are Gatamansi oil and valerian oil along with other essential oils. Besides that, we are working with the export of spices like timur pepper, cinnamon products, cinnamon buds, um, sil timur, black cumin and many others. Along with this, we are exporting raw medicinal herbs like chiraita, sopnut and others too. We are having organic certification for many of the products but besides the organic one we are also working on conventional products and in near future we are trying to get other uh, quality certificates like ISO, GMP, kosher and others. In the last 15 years of our existence we have worked many business organizations around 15 plus countries of the globe. Our mission is sustainable to achieve sustainable development goals like no poverty, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, responsible consumption and production. Our um, we invite all of you to join us in our mission to introduce the goodness of Nepal around the globe. Namaste. I am Bhanu Bhaktari Jal from Nomana House Processing Center, Khajura 2 Bank in Nepal. Our company is dealing with the processing and marketing of essential oil of wild varieties as well as cultivated species of medicinal and aromatic plants. Our major production of essential oil grows from wild harvested including Jatamasi oil, Valerian oil, Janthuzalim oil. Almost 75% of our product are wild harvested. Our major destination market are German, USA, China, India. We yearly turn over on 75,000 American dollars. We are a socially responsible company who care for environment and create to employ, employment opportunity. Our products are of the high quality, so this was, uh, which are source sustainability. Uh, uh, five of the companies that we are working with uh, we will be happy to ones, provide but, the uh, sample uh, and additional that we wanted to detail uh, of detail. our products look for our long term having done that uh, I wanted to are. now Thank give the floor much. to uh, Emily uh, King from Farewell uh, who I'm sure will be able to tell us about um, what why Farewell to why Farewell uh, here uh, in Nepal um, and to give us an introduction to that. So, okay, Emily, I give the floor to you. Yes, thank you, Yolanda. <laughs> and uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending today to learn more about both the project, about the producers, and also um, a little bit more about what Fair Wild is. Um, next slide, please, Yolanda. Um, so we've heard Fair Wild mentioned a, a few times um, during the webinar so far, but you might not be familiar with what Fair Wild is. Um, so Fair Wild is a not-for-profit foundation that is based in Switzerland. Um, we work all over the world to further our mission of transformation of resource management and business practices for wild plant supply chains um, to be sustainable um, and socially minded and fair traded. Uh, next slide, slide please, Yolanda. Um, and the main way we do this and the way we sort of further that mission is through the Fair Wild Standard. 
Um, so the Fair Wild standard is a comprehensive standard um, which can be um, complemented by third party audited certification and it covers uh, sustainable harvesting and fair trade principles for wild harvested plants, fungi and also lichen. Um, and it really is unique when it was established, especially for its focus on wild collection and wild collection of wild um, plant species um, in particular. Um, and it can also be applied anywhere in the world, so it can be applied in any country. Um, next slide, please. So the standard um, looks at several different um, aspects. Um, it focuses, of course, on, on the wild collection, sustainable wild collection, and there's a number of um, sort of detailed aspects to that. But the main aim is to maintain wild plant resources and prevent negative envir environmental impacts in the areas of harvesting. Um, we also then have a whole set of um, standards that look at aspects of the standard, look at the social and fair trade requirements. Um, so that might be familiar to you from, it's sort of analogous to other fair trade standards as well, but uniquely tailored for um, the context of wild plant harvesting and the type of um, work and sort of situations in which, which wild plant harvesting can occur. Um, so we look, for example, at um, you know, fair contractual relationships, uh, benefits for collectors and their communities, um, fair and safe working conditions, and uh, sort of no participation of um, children in wild collection activities as, as contracted workers. Um, we also then have the, the legal and ethical requirements, um, so, you know, complying with laws, regulations, but also really looking at customary and traditional uses um, and benefit sharing as well. Um, and then we also have some which look more at the sort of business um, operational side of things. So responsible management practices, responsible business practices. And we also encourage commitment of buyers throughout the trade chain as well. Um, next slide, please. So certification um, is one option. Um, we do encourage use of the standard um, just as a guide and best practice. Um, but obviously some companies wish to take that further um, and look at actually having that, that implementation verified. Um, so it's third party audited as a certification standard. And we work with four different um, control bodies throughout the world who can carry out those audits. Um, and it's an annual audit that happens on site by one of those control bodies. Um, we also have a continuous improvement approach. So that means that over the first five years of certification, um, businesses have a bit of, of scope to grow into um, the, the Fair Wild standard. Um, and it means that they can, they can build up um, in terms of what is required of them over each of the five years. Um, and we also have slightly different criteria for higher risk species. So that might be if the species is being harvested um, is maybe more impacted by that harvesting, um, or maybe occurs um, less commonly, then there's extra criteria that businesses have to show that they, um, they meet it, uh, during the audit. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of how this relates to, to businesses and the rest of the trade chain, um, the certification really applies to that um, collection operation. And they are the business that undergoes an audit. Um, they might, even if they don't uh, sort of pursue certification, they're the ones that would be implementing the standard. Um, and then businesses further up the trade chain can obviously interact with and support those businesses by purchasing ingredients from them. Um, so if um, businesses wish to purchase Fairwild certified ingredients and maybe use them in end products, then they register with the Fairwild Foundation so they can um, communicate that um, involvement publicly and really celebrate that they're supporting this great work. Uh, next slide, please. So just briefly, um, uh, fair wild in the international context. I mean, we've heard lots about how um, sort of sustainable harvesting and community involvement can be beneficial in the Nepal context. Um, and at a global level as well, um, it, it has uh, lots of, um, fair wild has lots of relations to sort of international agreements such as um, global strategy on plant conservation where it's a recognized tool. Um, it can also support implementation of CITES through, for example, um, informing um, the creation of non-detriment findings. Um, and something that's really great as well, and, and off, off, we hear from um, businesses further up the trade chains, such as brands that um, work with Fairwild ingredients, that is a really valuable aspect, is that um, Fairwild certification can really help support a number of the sustainable development goals. Next slide, please. Uh, and in terms of businesses that are working um, with fair wild ingredients, either producing them in certified operations or trading in them or using their end products, 
Um, you can see some of the businesses that are involved here, but they're also on the Fair World website. So it, it really is a, a global um, growing network in terms of businesses that are using Fair World ingredients, which is really great. Um, next slide, please. So just to bring it back to the, the project itself in terms of how Fair Wilds interacted um, in detail with the project. Um, so Nasty already um, mentioned the, the sort of training of harvesters um, on sustainable harvesting in the Fair Wild standard. Um, so there's been uh, several hundreds, over a thousand um, harvesters trained on, on that. Um, there was also setting up of a harvester registration system in each community forest user group. So that's a really key aspect of, of Fair Wild is, is the traceability and sort of knowing um, who the harvesters are and sort of the level, uh, the amount of product that they've harvested as well is a really key part of that. So it's really great that that system is in place now. Um, there was also development of a Fair Wild premium fund. Um, so as part of the fair um, trading aspects of Fair Wild, there's, there's the sort of um, fair payment uh, for the ingredients or products that are being sold, but there's also an additional payment that's made and it goes into a premium fund, which can be used for the benefit of the collectors and local community. So it's um, diplomatically decided on what that is goes towards. We don't sort of make stipulations about what that can be used for, um, but some examples you know, other organizations have done are, for example, paying for um, uh, dentists to visit remote communities that didn't have regular access to dental care, um, provision of um, play equipment for local children to use, um, provision of uh, bicycles so that collectors get to the collection sites more easily and, and so on. Um, and the really exciting thing now is that um, as a result of this project, um, not only have so many um, harvesters been trained, so many um, producer operations now familiar with what Fair Wild Standard is and what it involves, but four community forest user groups um, in collaboration with an exporter have now undergone a Fair Wild audit um, and we're expecting a decision on that audit and certification um, in the coming months. So I think um, just it, for the time, so it would be great to be able to take questions from everyone. So I'll finish it there. Um, but if you do have any questions, there's lots of information on our website or you can always get in touch with um, myself at secretariat at fairwild.org. Thank you very much, Emily, for this, this overview introduction into Fair Wild. Uh, great to get your inputs on what Fair Wild does and what it has been doing in, in Nepal. Uh, so for those of you who have more further questions to Emily about uh, Fair Wild, uh, please contact her. I've also put here all the contact information from the five companies that uh, were introducing themselves in today's webinar, um, as well as uh, all of us from the project side. So if you have any further questions or would like to contact us about this project uh, or contact the companies um, about uh, their offering, please uh, feel free to do so. And with that, um, I'd like to conclude uh, today's webinar. I want to thank you all very much for participating, uh, for your inputs, for your questions. Uh, it was great to hear from you. And uh, as I mentioned before, if there's anything further that you'd like to discuss with us or ask us, uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.